Boa tarde. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the second day of the second EPINACHI meeting of natural polymers. We are starting the first block of food and agriculture section. Uh, let's begin. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Francisco Goicolea from University of Leeds, UK, to start the first block. Uh, Professor Francisco is a chair of biopolymers at School of Food and Science and Nutrition. His main research interests focus on fundamental and applied aspects of polysaccharides derived from biowaste and biomass, particularly in understanding how different types of biopolymer-based nanostructure materials interact with biological networks. This knowledge is used in the development of sustainable and health foods and biomaterials. He collaborates actively with universities, research institutes, and companies in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Please, Francisco, you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I should see my, my screen. Just one second. Okay, share screen. Okay, I'm trying to get my screen shared. Is it is it already working? I don't know. I can't see your. But but not not, not, yet. not yet. Okay. Not yet. Share screen. Share. And now? No, I'm not seeing. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So I click in share screen and screen. Share screen. Okay. So if I now go, sorry. I say share. Oh gosh, why is it not working? Dear. God, why is it not working? Is it not working yet? No. Not oh yet. my God. Why is it not working? Oh God. Okay. Fabius, you can help him. Oh gosh, I don't know what's happening. Professor, you go yeah. and share screen below the Kichi Yoshida. Yeah, I, I, click, I click share screen. Yes, and then I, uh -huh. I I see share screen, and then I'm clicking there. We not see your screen to share. And I said share. Oh. Share. Is it working? No. Why is it not working? So when I say share screen, I have your entire screen, and that's I'm clicking there. Then I said share. Yes. Is it working now? Not yet. No. Professor is in the Google Chrome browser. No, no, I, I closed the Google Chrome. Which browser professor are using now? So I say share screen and then. Did you leave the meeting, the Google Meet? Did you close the Google Meet? I close the previous meet. Yes, I close. I I close the Google meet. So I said share screen, share screen. Then I said share my entire screen. And still not work. Not if yet. I now go to PowerPoint. No, not yet, Francisco. 
Oh no. What is it? What, what, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> so their screen. I can't help. No our professor. We, <laughs> we, we will have help. <laughs> <laughs> I can okay. I say share screen, then comes application window. I choose PowerPoint and I say share. Mm -hmm. No, just go in share screen. Yeah. And uh entire screen and screen screen mom one. Share. Not guy or not Chrome or no no I'm not just, I'm not I'm I just tried to go back to PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't work. Uh, Francisco, I think it's yeah. better if you get out of the link and try again the uh, the link. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Let's just go back. Right, so I. Okay, so I should I I close the link totally. Close the link, yeah. Close the link and try but, again. But but actually the link was sent from the Google Meeting room, and I don't know how to come back here. If you if is it possible to to post it put it on the chat? I will send it in the private chat. Okay, so I go back to the private chat. Oh gosh, I'm terrible. Yeah. Okay. There is. Okay. Hi, Francisco. Hi, Kitty. Again. Very good. <laughs> well, let's go again. <laughs> so, okay, let's try again. Share screen. Okay. Is it, is it now working? No, not yet. No, not yet. <sighs> oh, God. Why is it? We would try to attempt it. <laughs> what can we do? So, your screen. Do you want to send the the presentation? And, uh, send your presentation in my email. Okay, Fabrice, I will do that. Yes. Uh, sorry. I, I will share. I will share my screen. So I send it to to Cayo Cayo or to. I I have uh, the email. I will send my email private chat. For professor send the presentation. Okay, sorry about it. This is alive. <laughs> this is oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly yeah, sorry. Yeah. All the audience. Mm -hmm. we, we we did a test on Friday and everything was fine. So I, I really don't know what's happened. Yes, me too. In, when we test the live last week, Professor. Yes, exactly. Uh, I can send the presentations yeah. to, to Kitty. Uh, to me? Yes. Share the yeah. screen, please. Okay, I, I, I sent it, Kitty. Okay. Wait. 
Fabrício? I sent to you, I think you... You share screen, né? Fabrício? Vai em share screen, professor. Chegou? Ainda não? Não, Ainda não chegou, professora. No. For me, it's necessary to. I need to. To do a login. I can assess as, as uh, it's, it's it's okay, okay. Um, I can open window, okay. Oh, do you want to send back? To... Oh, my God. I'm trying to open, but is it, is it not working? I, no, I need to. But uh, okay, let's go. Um,
change to another computer. Hi, Francisco. It works. It works. Oh, Good. Okay. I'm terribly sorry. So. Oh no, it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Everyone. I think it's not a lot of time left. First of all, I want to really apologize. It's it's incredible i'm really sorry i don't know really what happened but um of course i will not be able to to to, to give the lecture i wanted to give but uh, first of all i want to thank the organizing committee for for this invitation and um well even when they are in we are in the middle of this of this uh, crisis it's uh, one probably one of the good things is that we can reach so many people and i know that behind the screen there are many many people and uh, Thank you very much for, for this. So, yeah, I will have to really rush very quickly through, through my presentation, but um, let's skip the, the introductory part. Um, I actually wanted to talk with you today about functional foods. So we, we know that the market of functional foods is, is one of the fastest growing one in the world. And we start to see the shelves full of this kind of healthy products which actually actually have something that goes beyond nutrition. So functional foods really are a special niche of products, which actually their functions, they have a physiological effect that goes beyond, beyond nutrition, right? And that actually makes them uh, very special. So uh, they must have also the necessary intensity. Okay, so that's the space for functional foods. Uh, we can, I actually developed this slide also thinking about the functionality of biopolymers. And we can also think about physiological and healthy effects, but we can also think about the environmental effects. So we can have actually polymers that have beneficial or positive effects, um, and then they would have different uh, functional intensity, as we can see on the X axis. So we have actually on the positive ones, we have the, the natural polymers, of course, those coming from renewable raw materials. And the other extreme will be, of course, the, the petrochemical raw materials or uh, other synthetic polymers. And in this space, actually, we can, we can actually have, for example, polymers which are biodegradable that probably can come part of, of biomaterials, food packaging and other applications. Then we can actually identify here, for example, in the in the field of foods, the hydrocolloids, texture modifiers, emulsifiers, which uh, have a function. Some of them actually overlap with the with the with the dietary fiber, which is mostly comp comprised, as we know, by non-cellulosic, uh, sorry, non-starch polysaccharides that occur in the cell wall of plants, and they do have beneficial health effects as we know. And then we have this other space for bioactive polymers in which we will have polymers that will display other special bioactivities such as antimicrobial, mucoadhesive, osteoinductive, adjuvants, and so on. And then we could actually think about polymer drugs, actually, when we conjugate drugs directly in the, poly in the polymer chain. Okay, so that's something which mirrors, for example, what I was discussing about functional foods. So we can also discuss about functional polymers. Now, uh, I have uh, had the chance to listen to excellent lectures in, 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 in this day and a half. And in fact, well, we are focused in this conference on natural polymers. And within the natural polymers, we pay special attention to those that we can derive from bio waste, particularly from waste from the seafood industry, shrimp, uh, crab, and other sources, which are sources of chitin and chitin. A lot of, I know there have been a lot of conferences on, on chitin and chitosan. Um, these are polymers that we know we have, uh, I have been working on these polymers probably throughout all my, my scientific uh, life. And, and actually in Latin America, they occupy a very special place also because the, uh, the availability of bio waste in Latin America is huge, and Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico are big players in this arena. Uh, the the market for kitesan has been growing over the last the last two decades, 
And actually, one of the new, well, most recent markets is the food and beverages, along, of course, with healthcare, medical devices, and the more established ones like water treatment, cosmetic, and toiletries. So Kytosan, uh, one, of the, one of the important things to recognize is that it's a family of biopolymers. So actually, it's, it's a chitin-derived beta-1,4 link amino polysaccharide in which part of the acet acetyl groups have been removed that occur in native chitin and then leaves us with polymers that can vary in their, in their size and polydispersity, in their degree of residual acetylation, and then there is a third dimension to this, which is the pattern of acetylation. So far, all chitosans that we find in the market are produced chemically and generate random, random wise patterns of acetylation. However, the third generation of chitosans are actually now being available. We are about to submit a paper that describes actually the, 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 the know-how, the, the technology to generate using enzymes, block-wise chitosans, and they have very different properties to the chemically produced ones. Of course, in principle, it should be possible maybe in future to generate alternate acetylated, deacetylated, uh, block, uh, pat um, uh, alternate pattern chitosans. So how do we deal with all this diversity with characterization? We need to implement always robust methods of characterization to know what is the identity of the chitosans that we are working with. And actually, chitosan has a number of different bioactivities, as I just list them here. I have to go very quickly, but, but we know, for example, it's mucoadhesive, biodegradable, it's, it has low toxicity, and it has other special effects, such as for example, the capacity to condense genetic materials. It's been claimed also to have adjuvant activity, wound healing, uh, hemostatic, and then for the in the food space, also there, there it's been shown that chitosan actually leads to lower uh, LDL cholesterol. So actually, this is a matrix that was con conceived by Bruno Mosbacher in, 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 in Munster. We can see that the two of the main variables, the degree of polymerization, the degree of acetylation, we can see this is the chitin space. And actually in this matrix, we can actually plot which are the chitosans that exhibit the, the, the most, um, uh, in, the, the most bioactive properties, for example, mucoaddition, gene condensation capacity, antibacterial activity. And then we need to know this, this behavior for the application that we are thinking of. So I, uh, as, as I wanted to focus on food, actually I show in this table the three type of claims that have been actually applied at le in Europe for chitosan. The, so they are reduction in body weight, maintenance of uh, normal blood LDL cholesterol, and reduction of transit time. So out of the three claims, only the one related to cholesterol is being approved. Actually, there have been enough studies systematic via these systematic reviews to show that there is a small but statistically significant reduction in total and LDL cholesterol by chitosan, whereas the other claims have not been yet uh, able to be, to be demonstrated scientifically. Now, I want to discuss briefly about encapsulation because that's one of the things we do with chitosan. So encapsulation brings several advantages like improved bioavailability and others. So for that, actually, we are able to generate a different family of different type of particles, either matrix-like particles or core shell systems or nano coated nanoemulsions. So I, in, the, in the case of nanoemulsions, we can prepare them by solvent displacement, basically by having an ethanol oil phase pour into an aqueous phase, and that will lead to phase separation, as we see in the little video here. And then we evaporate the ethanol and end up with a with either with a nanoemulsion or, or with a nanocapsule. So we can coat with different kinds of chitosans, as I show in this little table. And we have used this platform to encapsulate bioactives. So I will discuss today uh, very briefly now only about capsaicin, which is one of the bioactives that we've been mostly interested in. So capsaicin, it's, it's a is the principle of pungency of chili peppers, but it also has very interesting biological activities. So we have actually worked in encapsulation of capsaicin in nanocapsules coated with cap chitosan and then studied their release and then in vitro and sensory studies. 
So these are just the characteristics. I go very quickly about that. We can see actually that encapsulating capsaicin, we can modulate the pungency. We can actually reduce the, the, the pungency. However, we see also that the uncoated nanoemulsions also have the same effect. So we cannot be totally sure that chitosan is bringing this effect. Okay, now I, I move to another slide quickly. Uh, right, so what we have seen in vitro is that capsaicin, uh, encapsulated cap capsaicin somehow directs the, the movement of epithelial cells. So these are model studies. And what we I show in this couple of graphs is actually the speed at which the cells in an epithelial um, monolayer displays. And we can see that only the... Uh, encapsulated capsaicin leads to this directed and faster movement. We need to still uncover what is the significance of this behavior. We know that the permeability of other substances or model or drugs increases when we also co-deliver encapsulated capsaicin. I want to nearly by finishing referring to this, this, this collaboration with uh, Professor Kitty Yoshida and Vinicius Maciel actually, he came to our lab and we actually, in, uh, what we did is use another type of system using uh, chitosan and pectin to actually associate an extract from this Brazilian um, uh, non-traditional food source, which is Ora Pronovis, I'm sure you, you will know it, and actually develop uh, particles of different charge ratio. And what is special about this extract is it's very high in ion. So then we, what we did was to study also the increase in the bioavailability of ion. When we delivered it, associated it into these nanocomplexes, we could actually see that there was a, a, the cells would uptake the ion and will actually express more ferritin. So that's an example of the use of, of biopolymers to actually generate uh, or enhance the bioavailability of, of a natural extract. So I don't want to actually exceed the time. Uh, Maybe I'll just go very quickly. This is slides. What I wanted to discuss with you are the filling of pro, uh, mealworm protein insect isolate gels produced by transglutaminase using chitin nanofibers. So I will just go to the slide that shows that by adding very small, tiny fractions of chitin nanofibers, the modulus of these gels actually uh, increases and that follows a pattern that we believe is governed by percolation because we could see that fibers below a critical volume fraction are separated then they reach a threshold at which they percolate and then they form this kind of um, network uh, percolated network that is part of the explanation because we can see that this point at very high higher volume fractions do not fit with it and that's probably to do with the fact that the chitin Chitin had a slightly negative charge and, uh, sorry, positive charge and the, and the protein has negative charge. So maybe there is something else there apart from inert filling. And actually I will try to finish because I don't want to, to, to overrun with time. So if you want to discuss, I will be very happy to stay over. I, I'm terribly sorry that I had to go really rushing through this, uh, but really I will be very, very happy to, to discuss. Muito obrigado. And, um, and thank you very much to my working teams, both in Munster and more recently in Leeds, and also to all the collaborations uh, and sponsoring agencies. So thank you very much. Very, very fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Most of the time I was dealing with this problem. No, no, it's okay, totally okay. We have some normal problems of live representations. It's completely normal. Oh. And thank you for your presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have much no. time for questions now, but we can start to discuss. Yes, I will stay in the room the rest of my afternoon here. So please do come if you want to discuss. Thank you very okay. much again. Thank you the, very uh, much. Thank you very much. for the technical <laughs> issues. Thank you. <laughs> this is normal. Then we can go to Google Meet Room. Thank you very much for your great <laughs> Thank you uh, very contribution. Much. For us. And I like very much this, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Kitty. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> and go to the next. So, so I, I will close this, right? I don't know.
We have time for one question. Ah, okay, no. We can start the next one. Hi. Hi, Professor José Teixeira. Yes. <laughs> Plus, uh, speak Portuguese if you want. Uh, como quiser. <laughs> o que preferir? Eu acho que nós já estamos é, apresentando. Uh, can I present mm -hmm. you in English? You prefer? Sure, no problem. Okay. I'm pleased to, to present next speaker, Professor José Antônio Teixeira, from University of Minho, Portugal. Professor José Antonio Teixeira is full professor in the Department of Biological Engineering at the University of Minho. He has experience in chemical engineering with an emphasis on chemical engineering and biotechnology, mainly on bio biological reactors, multiphase systems, food technology, biological separation process. Please, Professor, professor José Antonio. Ok. Ok, eu estou a tentar partilhar o, o ecrã. Ah, desculpem lá. Ainda é isso. E agora? Porque não, Ainda que... não apareceu. Professor, a não tela não. já está compartilhada. É só o professor já pode ir direto para a apresentação. Ok. O professor já pode começar, então. Ok, está, não está? Pronto, so... agora é só dar para Sim, deu certo. Muito certo? Obrigado. So, hello everyone, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I was considering on what language should I use on this presentation, but um, I think that uh, considering that my Portuguese has a little different accent from most of the Portuguese that is spoken in Brazil, uh, I'll make my, my presentation in, in English. Even for me, it's easier because I have all, all my slides in English and I'm quite used to make presentations in English. So I hope you'll be able to, to, to understand me. So once again, thank you for, for inviting me to make this, this, this presentation. And uh, the title of presentation that I have here, as you can see, is Biopolymers from Linus Sloses as a Tool for Development of New Materials. Uh, so my name is is Teixeira. I come from 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 Portugal, from the north of Portugal. Um, I know that compared to Brazil, Portugal is a very small state. It's like uh, I would say, uh, Pernambuco, it's more or less same size. But anyway, uh, I come from north of Portugal, most precisely from Braga, that is where the Univers University of Minho is located. Uh, so for those who know Portugal, it's quite near Porto, okay? And um, okay, it's a quite, a, quite an old town, but it has very nice surroundings. The town is very beautiful. Um, it comes back to the Roman times. It has a very nice city center and it has, it has very nice, open and very pleasant surroundings. Uh, this is national national park close to the Spanish border, okay? So... Uh, as I said, I come from University of Minho, and my research center is the Center of Biological Engineering, and that, uh, as I said, is located at the University of Minho, 
and that has been rated as excellence since 2002 by the Portuguese Science Foundation, in a way the equivalent to, for instance, CAPS and, and other in, entities in Brazil. And we work generally on um, agro food health and environmental, industrial agro food health and environmental biotech, biotechnology. Um, and in particular, as, as, I, as it was told before, my main focus comes on um, industrial and food biotechnology. As a matter of fact, we, we have a, a research group, and as you can see, we call it Beef Factory, and we have a research line focused on bioprocess development and using natural resources and wastes. And from there, naturally, we move to uh, things like packaging and, and several food applications. I'm not going to detail all the activities we have, but I'd like to highlight that we started with, with these resources and wastes, and uh, we moved by to, to research activities where we make use of the fractionation process to, in this case particular, I'm going to talk about, to develop uh, uh, edible films or bio-based films for, for food applications, for instance, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, um, there, are, there is a wide variety of nat natural polymers. Um, lots of them are being used for several years. For instance, galactomanans are quite used for as a thickening in, in, agent, for instance, for food applications. Some, uh, some others are readily available. And um, considering the, our research interests and, and the, their big availability, we have focused on all our work or part of our work on the use of applications related with cellulose and lignin that originate typically. Uh, and I'd like to say that we are also wor working with, uh, with macrology, but uh, this, this presentation is focused on the use of linocellulosic materials. Okay, linocellulosic materials are effectively a very, very interesting material. There is a huge potential and has a great biotechnology value. Uh, so we can really, uh, from a natural source, a readily available natural source, produce uh, high-value added products. As I said, it's highly available, and it has, as a consequence, a low cost. It is really a, a, rene a renewable source of energy, and uh, it can help on the implementation of the, the so-called biorefineries. So it's really the alternative to petroleum refineries. And apart from that, it's a non-food material. So it does not compete with food crops. And that has been one of the big discussions concerning the use of starch, for instance, as, as, a, as, a, as a material for, for other compounds. So really, linoslosics have several advantages. And in a way, we want to take, care, uh, take advantage of this situation. Um, and uh, as you know, okay, it's very easy to talk about linoslosics, but linoslosics, it's a very complex material. You know, it has, and here are some examples of some linoslosic materials that, can, that are available. Sugar cane, widely available in Brazil. Uh, corn, bagasse, um, uh, harvest wastes, corn cobs, and so on, readily available materials. In Portugal, there are several. The wine processing, for instance, is a, 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 a linoslosic material available in, in high amounts. And as you know, these linoslosic materials generally have three main components, okay, that are distributed according to the type of material that, that is being applied, okay. And we can see here that uh, typically we have, as I said, we have three main compounds. We have cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, okay. And roughly each one represents one third of the overall composition of these of this linocellulosic materials. Uh, but as a matter of fact, they form a very complex structure that is very difficult to degrade. Uh, and so lots of challenges are associated with this degradation. And uh, this, in a way, the, implies the development of new processes for the, uh, the composition of this material in their main, compo their main components and make use of the technological potential of those main com components, okay? Um, and you can see here in this slide some 
of the possible applications of these main components, okay? Uh, cellulose, everyone knows the use of cellulose, but there, there are there the, 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 some of the relevant applications of in, um, um, relevant applications and uh, characteristics of this material. Hemicellulose, hemicellulose, farminocellulosic materials is gaining an increase in importance, um, particularly due to the properties of the main component of these hemicellulose material that are the, the xyloligosaccharides that have been gaining interest, for instance, for food applications, okay? And uh, 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 complementary to this, we have lignin, okay? Lignin that I think has been the, in a way the less, just, less studied material of this, but has some advantages that are pointed here, there. Antioxidant, antimicrobial properties, they can, will allow, it's possible to improve the organolytic properties. Foods can prevent food degradation and can have some other application, even in, in health related issues. So, our work, um, and although we have been working on the entire uh, um, valorization, let's say, of these linoslosic materials. And we have been working quite a lot on development of pretreatments for the, in particular, for bio, for second generation bioethanol production. What I will present here it has to do with a lot with the use of lignin and the application of lignin in the first part of the presentation. Second part of the presentation, I'll move to another material that is related with another waste, but it's not a material very rich in cellulose. Okay, when we think about these linocellulosic wastes, and I'd like to remember that uh, linocellulosics are the most abundant material when you deal with food waste, for instance, and you know that we lose, let's say, one third of the food we are producing, uh, we can consider different treatments and according to the treatment, treatments applied, and we, if, if we can, in a way, uh, divide those treatments into main groups, physical chemical treatments and chemical biological pretreatments, and we can have and different strategies and different fractionation strategies and different products in the end according to the pretreatment that is applied. We can have one group that is the physical chemical pretreatment where basically in the first phase we get a cellulose lignin enriched fraction and another fraction of the hemicellulose mainly uh, fraction rich in, in xylose and according to the degradation that is rich xyloligosaccharides. Uh, and we can have on the other side uh, the mainly chemical biological pretreatments where typically in the first phase we have, a, let's say, a delignification step. And we have a fraction rich in cellulose and hemicellulose and another fraction uh, rich in lignin. Okay? And these are the strategies that are traditionally described for pretreatment of, of, of biomass and the fractionation procedures and the products that, that, that are obtained, okay? And obviously, challenge related to this is have to do with the yield that we can get, the enzymatic load that is needed in particular in the, the, the when you use biological pretreatments, and really this is a challenge in different steps of the, these processes. We can consider the use of solvents and the, 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 the ratio solvent solvate is to be used. We can consider the, the, the presence of inhibitory compounds that are formed in some, in some of their treatments. So there are lots of challenges that are being addressed by several groups trying to optimize, let's say, the, 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 the fractionation of these linocellulosic wastes. As I said, um, we in the in the end what the challenge we have are to develop a cost effective processes we want to have a, a greener as possible pretreatment technology and we want the the biorefinery in the end we want to implement a biorefinery that can operate using different kinds of feedstocks and then we have different materials they have, they have this defined chemical composition with associated physical properties and structural characteristics, okay? So going back to what we did in, in particular, uh, as I said, our starting material, one of the starting materials we've been working with is corn cob. Uh, and what we, and you can see corn cob is a material that is, is around one third, uh, uh, one third of the, 
the data composition is um, is cellulose and then has around uh, not one third but around 25 or more percent of um, of uh, hemicellulose and then 20 percent around lignin okay and corn cob we worked in corn cob because it is quite available and what we did here as you can see in this title we integrated liquid hot water with organosol treatment okay trying to see if by using this strategy and the aim of this work was really to improve the quality of lignin that we were obtaining to see if we could, could by using this integrated strategy to use uh, to obtain a higher purity lignin than using just liquid hot water or, or organosol and this is the the, the flow chart of the process that that we developed okay we started with corn cob we milled it we did liquid water treatment in the conditions that are presented 200 centigrade degree centigrade in 30 minutes this was optimized as well as the what so, uh, solid water ratio and then from liquid hot water we got a fraction that was as expected uh, containing most of cellulose and lignin and then we had the hydraulic where the emissions were applied and then we apply to this cellulose lignin fraction an organ solve process with ethanol okay and from this we were able to separate the cellulose and then precipitate the lignin with a high purity and also with a very high antioxidant activity and as, as you can see here, we measure the anti antioxidant activity of the lignin. Um, uh, and we compare with some commercial antioxidants. And we can see here, obviously, depending on the concentration, but we can see here that it had a very interesting uh, uh, antioxidant capacity. Okay. From this, um, we started consider why not use because as i said we were interested in another line of research we, we have is the development of new materials films and so on and for packaging for instance for other applications for for food applications and we consider the incorporation of this this lignin in and use of this lignin in in, in a, a bio-based field okay films uh, that usually have uh, fil the film for, for forming material and can incorporate surfactants and plasticizers so that we have the film with the required properties in the end uh, we can also add some compounds like some functional additives like is the case of lignin okay and uh, what we did and uh, before that um, we know that the challenges of these bio-based films are related with these things. Water sensitivity and high solubility in water, low barrier properties, mainly water vapor permeability related with their water sensitivity. Usually they can have, uh, they have poor mechanical properties. We can functionalize them with biological compounds. And obviously we have to minimize the safety issues and compatibility, optimize compatibility with food applications, okay? And what we did was really to develop carboxymethyl cellulose-based films, incorporating this lignin that we obtained by the organosolve process. And this is the very simple scheme of what we did by using a casting method and using this ethanol organosolve lignin, we develop different film forming different materials you can see here the bio-based films with increasing concentrations of, of lignin and as expected as you increase the concentration of lignin we have an increased value uh, an increase of the darkness let's say of the film as expected considering that the uh, ethanol organ offset org organos of lignin is slightly dark okay here we have some photographs some same micrographs of the semi ECMC lignin blended films and we can really see the impact of the incorporation of lignin in structured films okay we have different have different aug uh, augment uh, uh, augmentations here okay and you can really see that as we increase the concentration of lignin we get different texture of properties and from this we move to some uh, characterization chemical structure here we may have ATR, FTI 
measurements and we can really see the presence of lignin as we increase the, 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 the EOL percent, percentage. And we measure some of the relevant properties of these films, okay? We have here the physical properties of CMC lignin blended films and we can really see here, apart from the increase in thickness, we can see the effect of this of the incorporation of lignin in different uh, uh, the incorporation of lignin in the relevant properties, mainly moisture, water sol sol solubility, and water vapor permeability of these films, and we can really see the effect on, mo on moisture, okay, the impact on water solubility, and also on the transport properties of water. Um, uh, uh, in the uh, water vapor permeability in, in the film. And you can see really that there is a significant impact of the incorporation of this lignin on these films. And then overall, we can conclude concerning water properties that the addition of lignin to slows based films improves their sensitivity to, to water. We also uh, evaluated the thermal properties and we measure some relevant parameters for the, um, for this related with thermal properties. But overall, and you measure Tg, T on set, and T max, and weight loss. And overall, you can really see the effect, and that there is really an effect um, on some of these properties. Not as significant as uh, other uh, related properties, but anyway, the overall conclusion is that the addition of lignin cellulose based films improves their thermal stability. And we also measure the mechanical properties of these, uh, these blended films. And we measure the impact of the concentration of lignin on the tensile strength, elongation at break, and young models of these materials. And we can really see here the effect of increasing concentration of this EOL, of this lignin, on the, all these parameters that are related with mechanical properties. Okay. And in the end, we, as our first target was to develop films with improved uh, anti antioxidant properties, we evaluated the antioxidant properties, in this case, the radical scavenging, scavenging activity of the films obtained the increasing concentrations of the EOL. And you can really see here that there is, as expected, a positive impact in the this in, in these properties as a result of the incorporation of this EOL lignin. So these are the main results we obtain on this biofilm, and basically on this we can conclude that the incorporation of this purified EOL lignin allows to improve the, res the water resistance of these films, as well as their moisture, water solubility, and water vapor permeability and thermal stability. Mechanical properties were not significantly improved, okay? And we obtained films with an excellent antioxidant capacity, and this really uh, indicates that can be used, these films, these materials can be used with antioxidant properties in food packaging films. One of the other aspects, and I know that I'm talking already for 20 meters, something like that. Um, another material we worked with, and I have this, this results, these results here are spent coffee grounds. That, as you know, it's a very important waste. It is obtained during soluble coffee preparations. And we get huge, huge amounts of this coffee industries byproducts. OK? And really, here we did, let's say, a similar approach, but not exactly the same. Because these materials are linear loss materials, but they are not rich in cellulose. They are rich in hemicellulose. Okay, and we I bring here this example because it's a, a different linear loss material. And the target in the end, when we started this project, is what to develop a, a coating for this golden berry. Okay, and what we did we used spent coffee grounds as starting material. We made two. We made two alternative strategies. One was an alkali treatment, and the other was an autohydrolysis treatment. And here we obtained two extracts, one that was obtained by alkali treatment, and the other was that was obtained by autohydrolysis. Okay, and then we went to evaluate the properties and the relevant properties of these extracts, okay? 
Uh, here we can see composition. As I said, most of the uh, met, uh, sugars present are uh, uh, from the hemicellulose fra fraction. It has a, 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 a small content of cellulose. And you can see here that according to the treatment, we have extracts with different compositions and different relative contents of the, 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 the polysaccharides. Interestingly, in the extracts, the content of phenolic compounds is slight, slightly the same. Okay, here we can see we made a very simple chemical characterization, chemical characterization, and really we, we can see here that um, the the main sugars present, as expected, are glucose, suggesting a small amount, very small amount of uh, cellulose, and then others, as I said, galactose, arabinose, and, man and manose. Okay. Another interesting properties of this is that these extracts also have a very interesting antioxidant activity. Okay. We also, as our target was to apply these extracts in a fruit to extend their shelf life, the, the shelf life, we evaluated fungal growth. And we can see here that um, it's not very clear, but there is, a, a, after 96 hours, a, a, let's say, a, a, a reduction in fungal growth as we compare to control. But as we increase the concentration of the extra, of this, um, um, uh, uh, increase the concentration of these polysaccharides, we really have fungal growth suggesting that the polysaccharides can effectively be used as a substrate. Anyway, this is just, this is an information for this. And then we also evaluated by some, some of the extracts and we can see really that we have different structures when you have the alkaline or the, the autohydrolase extract, okay? And these images are, here in point B, are images uh, the first, these are uh, the extracts, and here the, the, we have same images for uh, CMC-based films with and without the incorporation of the, the, the extracts, okay? And really, we can see also the effect, and we can see that the effect is, is depending on the extract that you are using. And then... We continue the evaluation of some of the properties of these CMC films that were prepared with the CMC at 1.5 concentration and also with the 0.5% concentration of glycerol. Okay. And we evaluated, as previously, relevant properties the thickness, the moisture content, the water sol solubility, the water vapor permeability, and obviously the contact angle that is also related with contact with water. And we can see here that both extracts have an impact on the moisture and, and water properties, moisture, water solubility, and water vapor permeability. But the effect is depending on the type of extract we are using. Okay. For instance, if you look here for the water solubility, uh, you can see that of, and the different effects of alkaline extract and the um, Autohydrolase extract, okay? And we may conclude generally that extracts rich in polysaccharides obtained by alkali pretreatment uh, or autohydrolase have a different effect on the water uh, water related properties of these, of these films. We also measured color properties and mechanical properties. And we can see really as expected that the, op the op opacity as shown in a previous slide really is impacted, let's say, by the presence of these of these extracts, and an impact is also observed in some, uh, not uh, in a way, on the mechanical properties, location to break and tensile strength. Okay, and then we went just to, to close to this this part of the work, and then I'm about to finish. We produced the films with the, the different extracts. And then we measured, measured color, okay, that's what I've said. And then we decided to incorporate them on these golden berries, okay? 
and the student who was who was doing this was from Colombia and really she was very interested in this golden berries application and we measured a very important permit that is that is relevant for the application of these films in different surfaces that is spreading coefficient and we select this pH this alkaline extract point 20 for for further application and in the end we evaluated the the antibacterial effect of the extract, and really we confirmed that in the presence of the extract, the anti the, the, there was an improved in antibacterial effect of the of the of the coating. Let's say when compared with uh, non coated non coated uh, non coated um, golden berries. Okay. And overall, we can conclude that the addition of these uh, extracts rich in polysaccharides extracts from spent coffee grounds to CMC-based CMC films affect film matrix and change its properties, improving or at least preserving its physical chemical properties. Color and the opacity were the main properties affected by the polysaccharides incorporation uh, and the light barrier. If the target is, is improving a light barrier, the light barrier film was significantly improved. Okay. And in the end, we could obtain by this strategy um, films with improved uh, functional properties, namely antioxidant and antimicrobial improved properties. Uh, and then we this can be a relevant conclusion, a re relevant result for the publication in food area. Overall, just to conclude, and I think I'm just using my time. Biopol we can conclude that biopolymers from silinous laws can be effectively used in development of new materials. And I presented two cases for two different materials and the composition of linear laws and the properties of the obtained fractions. And this has a lot to do with the extraction process, not only material, starting material, but extraction process are really key points are determinants on the applications to be developed. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor José Teixeira, for your excellent presentation. We have a time for one question, I think. Um, Can I stop the to share or? You stop it, no? Anyway, I, I can listen to you, so that's okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, you can see me? No, I have to stop sharing, okay? Okay, okay. Uh, now I can see you. Okay. What about the cost of lignin production? Okay, we did not make uh, really an evaluation cost. Okay, and this, uh, the, what we tried to do really in this part of the process was to have a, a lignin with improved properties. And really our main objective was really achieved because we could get a 99% lignin okay. that can be further used. So that's that, that was our target. We believe that this can be an interesting alternative as lignin usually is not uh, applied for different operations. Only recently, lignin became a, a significant part of this, this lignin slosic material to be considered. And as we are really using techniques that have been developing, that have been developed of fractionation of cellulose and emicellulose, and apart from this, we are using clean technologies and we also can recycle the ethanol, I think that this can be a very interesting alternative. It really, we did not make any calculations considering this point. Ah, okay, okay. There is another question. Uh, what about the challenges of the casting technique? The challenges? Yeah. The uh, at lab, it's quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lab, it's like an industrial production. It's very, very complicated, no? I don't know if it is because there are. I'm not I, as I'm saying. I'm not an expert in polymers, but the things that people that work in polymers, that I think they have process control. Obviously, to in, incorporate uh, this um, in materials that are not very much started can have some challenges on spreading of the material on the surface. I think that could be the, the main the, the main issue, and the homogeneity, let's say, of the material and its application when we go to a higher scale. Ah, okay, okay. There's something. Okay. I think we should go to the Google meeting. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you again for your Okay, thank you very much. We can go to can you can go to discuss in Google Meeting Room. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you, you take me to the meeting room? Uh the link of the the link? Yeah, ah, you can the private chat. You see? Okay, where can I do that? Private chat. I will go to private chat, okay. Yeah, yeah. The the link is there. Thank you very much, Professor. Oh, okay. The link is on the private. Está onde? No chat, here, private, on the side. Yeah, but I'm not able to see it, effectively. I don't know why. Okay. Hmm. O professor está na... O professor está na sala de streaming, né? Sim. Sim. Aham. Uh -huh. Aí, em private chat. Sim. Da parte lateral da tela. Sim. Tem aqui. Clique ali. Ah, tem aqui e uma série de coisas. Um... Isso, tem aqui tem... Uma, uma série de comentários, efetivamente. Conseguiu Muito obrigado, trabalhar. professor. Ok. Muito obrigada, professor Eu... José Antônio. Ok. Aguardem só um minutinho, nós estamos esperando o palestrante e logo, logo daremos continuação com a última palestra dessa sala, a terceira palestra do dia. Muito obrigado e esperamos a compreensão de todos.
Boa tarde, pessoal. É, nós tivemos um probleminha técnico com o próximo palestrante, doutor Roberto Avena Bustilos, então nós vamos trocar a ordem da, das apresentações. Nós vamos passar agora para as apresentações dos vídeos dos alunos que foram selecionados e em seguida nós retomamos a programação com o doutor Roberto Avena Bustilos. Ok? Muito obrigada pela compreensão. Essa é a, são os probleminhas que acontecem com os eventos ao vivo, tá bom? Muito obrigada. Vamos assistir agora os vídeos dos alunos. Os trabalhos enviados. Olá, meu nome é Fabrício Tanaka e eu estou aqui para transmitir alguns recados importantes antes de transmitirmos os vídeos selecionados pelo Comitê Avaliador na área de alimentos e agricultura. Caso você tenha enviado o seu vídeo no e-mail da FNAT, não se preocupe. Ele foi recebido e avaliado e logo será postado. Também, caso você tenha visto a live pelo YouTube, não se preocupe, a sua presença foi contabilizada. Eu gostaria de agradecer a todos pela participação e pela compreensão e também gostaria de parabenizar aquele, os autores dos vídeos no qual foram selecionados. Muito obrigado. Para enviarem as suas dúvidas aos autores dos vídeos, nós sugerimos que vocês enviem as suas dúvidas no e-mail indicado no último slide fornecido pelos autores na apresentação ou que vocês se direcionem ao site do evento, à área desejada, ao vídeo desejado, cliquem em YouTube e enviem um comentário no vídeo. Ficará a critério dos autores responderem o e-mail ou os comentários. Por gentileza, pedimos que sejam gentis nos comentários. Bom dia a todos. Meu nome é Mirella Bertolo, eu faço doutorado na Universidade de São Paulo e eu estou aqui hoje para apresentar o trabalho intitulado Formulação de Emoções de Quitosana, Gelatina e Óleo de Pequim Propriedades Térmicas, Reológicas e Antimicrobianas Então, uma breve introdução é, A vida de prateleira dos alimentos é muito afetada por fatores externos como a presença de reagentes químicos, de micro-organismos o próprio clima e a exposição ao sol danos físicos durante o transporte e o armazenamento. Então, a busca por, ag por agentes preservantes naturais está cada vez mais acentuada. E é nesse contexto que a gente propõe aqui o desenvolvimento de emoções de quitosana, gelatina e óleo de pequi, devido às propriedades atóxicas, antioxidantes e antimicrobianas dos seus componentes. Experimentalmente, a quitosana foi obtida a partir das etapas de desproteinização e desacetilação de gládios de lula e o pó de quitosana foi solubilizado em ácido acético 1% para obtenção de um gel de quitosana 2%. A gelatina foi solubilizada em água a 60 graus durante 30 minutos para obtenção de um gel de gelatina também 2%. E o óleo de pequi em diferentes volumes 1, 2, 3 e 3 ml foi solubilizado em 1 ml de etanol. Para o preparo das emoções, os polímeros foram misturados na proporção de 2 para 1 a 2000 RPM durante uma hora à temperatura ambiente. E o óleo de pequi foi adicionado na proporção de 1 ml de óleo solubilizado em etanol a cada 50 gramas de mistura quitosana gelatina. Isso deu origem, então, às quatro emoções que aqui foram preparadas. A emoção controle de quitosana gelatina e as três outras emoções com diferentes concentrações de óleo de pequim. As emoções foram, então, deaeradas e seu pH foi ajustado para 5 para os ensaios posteriores de reologia, análise termogravimétrica e determinação da concentração inibitória mínima e da concentração bactericida mínima. Alguns resultados, então. Reologicamente, nós começamos pela varredura dos módulos elástico e viscoso 
em função da deformação aplicada às emoções, para a determinação da região viscoelástica linear, região em que esses módulos são constantes, independente da deformação aplicada. Para todas as emoções, G' foi maior do que G2', o que indica o seu caráter predominantemente elástico. E a inclusão do óleo de pequi, o aumento na sua, na sua concentração, só acentuou esse caráter elástico. Os módulos também foram variados em função da temperatura, e a gente percebe que a adição do óleo e o aumento da sua concentração levaram a temperaturas de gelificação menores, favorecendo, então, a formação da rede elástica. E, por fim, a gente também avaliou a viscosidade das emoções em função da taxa de cisalhamento nos ensaios de fluxo. Todas elas apresentaram um comportamento pseudoplástico típico de polímeros e o aumento da concentração de óleo de pequi levou a um aumento na viscosidade das emoções. Quanto à análise termogravimétrica, a gente pode perceber que a adição do óleo e o aumento na sua concentração levou a menores conteúdos de água, o que mostra, então, que o óleo realmente está interagindo com a rede polimérica, deixando-a menos disponível para interagir com a água. E, por fim, nos ensaios antimicrobianos, a gente percebe que a adição do óleo à emoção de quitosana e gelatina promoveu um sinergismo, uma vez que, houve uma diminuição nos valores de concentração bactericida mínima e concentração inibitória mínima contra a estafilococcus aureus, de 31,2 para 15,6 microgramas por ml. Então, concluindo, nesse trabalho foram desenvolvidas emoções de quitosana, gelatina e óleo de pequi. Reologicamente, a incorporação do óleo aumentou o caráter elástico das emoções, diminuiu sua temperatura de gelificação e aumentou sua viscosidade. A interação entre o óleo e a rede polimérica pode ser atestada pelos menores conteúdos de água por termogravimetria e a atividade antimicrobiana contra estafilococcus aureus foi maior para as emulsões contendo óleo de pequi em qualquer concentração do que para a emulsão sem óleo de pequi, o que indica, então, um sinergismo. Aqui estão nossos agradecimentos e os e-mails para contato caso tenha ficado alguma dúvida. Muito obrigada. Hello, I'm Carla Schnell, and the work that I'm going to present is about high strand silent phytosambiobacet pin prepared in the presence of ethanol. As introduction, we know that hemicellulose are one of the most abundant polysaccharides present in the lignocellulosic biomass. Particularly, this polymer has received greater interest for obtaining pins for packaging. Silan is the main component present in this hemicellulose, and previously, pin based on this polymer in combination with another natural polymer, the chitosan, were studied. The combination of these two polymers leads a polyelectrolyte complexes. So, the biobasic pin obtained in this way present high ionic interaction and excellent mechanical properties. Besides, it is well known that controlling some parameters, the final properties of film can be modified. But the effect of solvent has not been studied in depth. So, an alternative could be used a mixture of water ethanol as a solvent. Particularly, this solvent is used for silent precipitation and purification. So, the residual solvent present in this step could be used for prepared silent chitosan films. Methods first, silent solution with different ethanol concentrations were prepared. And the polyelectrolyte complexes were obtained by the dropwise addition technique, where silent solution was added to chitosan solution. A mass ratio of 60-14 silent chitosan was used. Then the film was forming by casting evaporation technique, and finally the film was demolding. And for some studies, the, the film were washed in the stillet water and red drying. Results: the particle size and zeta potential of the colloidal suspensions were studied. We can observe that the particle size of PEC was decreased when the ethanol contact was increased. And the opposite effect occurs with the zeta potential values. The dry mechanical properties of washed and not washed film 
were studied. And the best values of the stress at break were achieved when a 35% of ethanol uh, was used. And when the film were watched, we can observe that uh, the stress at break of film increased even more. The stress, the strain at break of not washed film was higher than washed one, but in both cases, the stress at break of all films prepared with a different ethanol concentration was similar. And the wet mechanical properties of the washed film was studied. We can observe that the stress at break of washed film uh, are affected by immersion in water. But the most of carbohydrate film present a very poorly strength in water. So the values obtained, obtained in this work are very promising. The solid and water vapor permeability of the film were also, also evaluated. Uh, we can observe that. The solid capacity of the film prepared with 35% of ethanol uh, slightly increased respect to the, the film prepared with, without ethanol. But a uh, not significant difference was observed uh, in the water vapor permeability. So as a conclusion, the presence of ethanol favorably modified interaction between poly electrolytes. And an ethanol content of 35% allowed to increase the dry mechanical properties of silent kites and film. And the results show that it's not necessary to remove the residual ethanol used for silent precipitation and purification for preparing the films. Thank you for your attention. Hola, pessoal, tudo bem? Meu nome é João Vitor, eu sou doutorando na Universidade Estadual Paulista Júlio de Mesquita Filho, da cidade de São José do Rio Preto, estado de São Paulo, e hoje eu apresentarei o trabalho intitulado Influência do Tempo de Sonicação e a Adição de Ácido Tutânico nas Propriedades dos Microgéis de Isolado Proteico de Soja. Primeiramente, uma breve introdução. As emulsões são sistemas formados por dois fluidos imissíveis, nos quais é necessário a adição de um agente que diminua a tensão interfacial entre esses dois fluidos. O que conhecemos normalmente como emulsões são aquelas estabilizadas por pequenas moléculas anfifílicas, chamadas de surfactantes. Porém, elas geram certa limitação em relação à estabilidade cinética do sistema emulsionado e também devido ao fato de algumas moléculas surfactantes apresentarem toxicidade ao ser humano. Porém, nos dias atuais, vem sendo muito estudada a emulsão de Pickering. Essas emulsões são estabilizadas por partículas sólidas, e essas partículas sólidas podem ser partículas de proteínas vegetais, como é o caso dos microgéis de isolado proteico de soja, proteínas de origem animal, o que fazem com que essas emulsões não apresentem a mesma toxicidade que as emulsões convencionais. Além disso, elas apresentam melhor estabilidade cinética que as emulsões é, tradicionais. Portanto, dado esse contexto, o objetivo desse trabalho foi avaliar as propriedades físicas e fisicoquímicas dos microgéis de isolado proteico de soja, produzidos com adição de ácido tânico e submetidos a diferentes tempos de sonicação, bem como a capacidade emulsificante desses microgéis. Para a produção dos microgéis de SPI, primeiramente uma solução com 10% em massa da proteína foi feita com água destilada e foi colocada para hidratação a 40 graus Celsius por 30 minutos e submetida à homogeneização mecânica. Nessa etapa, também foi adicionado o ácido tânico. Em seguida, a proteína foi desnaturada, resfriada e diluída com água destilada até que chegasse a 6% em massa de proteína na composição. Logo após, o pH da solução foi ajustado para 7, foi submetido novamente à homogeneização mecânica e, por fim, foi submetido à ultrassom de potência para que formassem os microgéis de SPI. Para a produção das emulsões de Pickering, 20% em massa de óleo de canola foi adicionado às suspensões contendo os microgéis de SPI. Dessa forma, essas suspensões foram homogenizadas em outra turx e também em ultrassom de potência, obtendo-se assim as emulsões de Pickering. Quanto aos resultados de tamanho médio dos microgéis de SPI, embora o ácido tânico, a adição dele, não tenha sido determinante para o aumento ou diminuição das partículas, o tempo de sonicação de um para 3 minutos, fez com que as partículas diminuíssem consideravelmente, 
fazendo com que houvesse diferenças significativas entre as Em relação aos resultados de tensão superficial e interfacial dos microgéis de SPI, pôde-se perceber que o ácido tânico contribuiu para que houvesse o um aumento de ambos os valores. Porém, quando se observam as proteínas nativas, ou seja, que não foram desnaturadas previamente, e as soluções contendo os microgéis de SPI, estas desnaturadas, não houve muita diferença em relação aos valores, tanto para a tensão interfacial quanto para a tensão superficial. Em relação aos resultados de estabilidade cinética das emulsões de Pickering, não houve detecção de índice de cremeação em nenhuma das emulsões. Portanto, elas se mantiveram estáveis durante todos os oito dias de armazenamento após a sua produção. Quando analisada a morfologia das emulsões por microscopia ótica e após um dia de sua fabricação, podemos perceber que as emulsões produzidas com o SPI nativo e com os microgés de SPI apresentaram um tamanho de gotas de óleo similares, enquanto as emulsões em que o ácido tânico estava presente apresentaram gotas de óleo menores, o que beneficia a estabilidade cinética do sistema. Portanto, o tempo de sonicação afetou diretamente o tamanho médio dos microgéis de SPI. Nas análises de tensão interfacial e superficial, a adição de ácido tânico foi determinante para que houvesse um aumento nos valores. O tamanho das gotas de óleo das emulsões produzidas com ácido tânico foram visualmente menores do que aquelas que foram produzidas sem o ácido tânico. Embora nenhuma das emulsões tenha apresentado índice de cremeação após oito dias de armazenamento. Outros estudos se fazem necessários para caracterizar melhor esses microgéis de SPI, tais como a microscopia de transmissão eletrônica, o ângulo de contato das partículas e também a, a hidrofobicidade da superfície proteica. Bom, por fim, gostaria de agradecer a comissão do segundo EPNAT pela oportunidade e também a CAPES pela concessão de bolsa de doutorado. Muito obrigado. Boa tarde, gente. Tudo bom? Meu nome é Gustavo Benevino Silva Chaves. Venho aqui apresentar para vocês um segundo encontro nacional de polímeros naturais, no qual o título do meu trabalho é Carvão ativado produzido a partir de resíduos do café com a combinação de carbonização e ativação química utilizando o cloreto de zinco. Começo meu trabalho falando aqui que o Brasil ele é o maior produtor de café do mundo, sendo o café um dos commodities também mais importantes que conhecemos. Ele é considerado o segundo maior commodity do mundo também. As cascas de café desse trabalho foram coletadas na fazenda de Cachoeirinha, em Pedrinópolis, Minas Gerais. Diante dessa alta produção de resíduos provenientes do café, o carvão ativado vem com a opção para agregar valor para esse material. Os objetivos desse trabalho foram a caracterização da casca de café a caracterização do carvão, a preparação do carvão ativado e a caracterização do carvão ativado. Para a metodologia do trabalho, a gente partiu da casca de café, onde ela foi moída e peneirada. Uma parte dela a gente utilizou para caracterizá-la. A outra parte a gente produziu o carvão ativado. Para posteriormente também a gente está caracterizando esse carvão. Neste trabalho, fizemos uma análise imediata, na qual determinamos o teor de voláteis, o teor de umidade, o teor de cinzas e a quantidade de carbono fixo. Para a produção do carvão ativado, a gente pegou aquele material que foi peneirado e moído, primeiramente, depois passamos para um processo de carbonização, na qual a celulose, a hemicelulose, a lignina, sofreu um processo de degradação, e, posteriormente, esse material foi levado para uma ativação química, na qual utilizamos o cloreto de zinco. Para análise da isoterma de adsorção, foi necessário, primeiramente, determinar o tempo de equilíbrio, na qual utilizamos o azul de metileno com um volume fixo em agitação com carvão ativado também com a massa fixa. Para o teste de adsorção, utilizamos também os mesmos parâmetros do azul de metileno em agitação com carvão ativado, na qual variamos a massa entre 5 a 50 miligramas. Ao analisar os resultados da análise imediata, conseguimos perceber que cerca de 26% em média é considerado carbono fixo e 5,8% é considerado cinzas. Foi realizado um estudo cinético para a absorção de azul de metileno sobre o carvão ativado. Foi determinado que nesse processo obedeça um modelo cinético de pseudo primeira ordem com a constante K igual a 2,33 hora menos 1. 
Para as isotermas de adsorção, foram testados os modelos de Langmuir e de Friendlich, no qual o modelo de Friendlich apresentou os melhores resultados de ajuste. Também foi determinado a máxima capacidade de adsorção do carvão ativado produzido, e foi o valor de 58,28 mg por grama. Esses resultados foram muito maiores do que para as cascas de café que foram somente descarbonizadas e não passaram pelo processo de ativação, e que praticamente também não absorveram nada do azul de metileno. Então, podemos concluir que é possível produzir carvão ativado a partir da casca de café, utilizando o cloreto de zinco como agente ativante. O azul de metileno ele segue uma reação cinética de pseudo primeira ordem, com a constante igual a 2,33 hora menos 1. E além disso, o modelo que se adequou melhor à isoterma de absorção foi a isoterma de Friendlich, na qual apresentou uma capacidade máxima de absorção de 58,28 mg por grama. Esses resultados indicam que o carvão obtido a partir das cascas de café e ativado com cloreto de zinco apresenta uma boa capacidade absortiva, indicando que esse pode ser um processo viável para o aproveitamento desse resíduo. E, para finalizar, os autores agradecem ao FTM, à FAPEMIG e ao FNDE pelas bolsas concedidas ao PET Ensino Química. Muito obrigado, gente! Olá, eu sou Gabriel Scalese, estudo em Engenharia de Alimentos na UFPE e vou falar um pouco sobre filmes biopoliméricos de resíduos de mandioca incorporados com ultramícios anômalos e o respectivo potencial antimicrobiano deles. Nosso trabalho foi desenvolvido de 2019 para 2020, sob a orientação da professora André Lina Santos. Então, a mandioca é uma das culturas alimentares de maior importância do mundo. E, industrialmente, é realizado principalmente processamento para a produção de fécula e farinha de mandioca. E esse processamento gera subprodutos como o bagaço e a entrecasca de, de mandioca, que são destinados geralmente para a alimentação animal. Só que esses, esses materiais são ricos em amido. Cerca de 75% de sólidos totais é constituído de amido. E o amido é sabido que ele pode ser utilizado para a produção de filmes e revestimentos biodegradáveis e comestíveis, que é o interesse da indústria de alimentos. Com o, o aumento da preocupação com o meio ambiente e com a segurança dos alimentos, essas embalagens de biopolímeros têm ganhado cada vez mais destaque. E estratégias que auxiliem esses biopolímeros, como as embalagens ativas, têm ganhado também espaço no, no mercado e na pesquisa. Nesse contexto, uh, o Icaramomyces anômalos entra como uma levedura que está presente em todo o ambiente, inclusive em superfície de frutas e vegetais, e tem um potencial killer, ou seja, ela é capaz de produzir toxinas que inibem o crescimento do, de outros micro-organismos. Uh, além disso, é um micro-organismo bastante, bastante versátil em termos de habitat, então ele tolera condições diferenciadas de salinidade, pH, estresse osmótico e temperatura. Então, é um micro-organismo bastante resistente. Por isso, esse projeto objetivou desenvolver filmes a partir do resíduo de amido com adição de suspensão de eucaramicis anômalos para identificar esse possível, a possível eficiência na aplicação de atividades ativas, de embalagens ativas. Para isso, inoculou-se as leveduras em meio YPG e submeteu-se esse, esse inóculo à agitação de 200 RPM e 30 graus Celsius por 48 horas. Em, Paralelamente, preparou-se a farinha de resíduo de mandioca, que foi constituída de, na proporção de 1 para 1, do resíduo seco da entrecasca com o resíduo seco do bagaço, que foram moídos e peneirados a 100 mesh. Com isso, foram produzidos filmes com 2,5% ou 5% dessa farinha residual, que foi acrescentado ou não da suspensão de leveduras. Para a produção dos filmes, utilizou-se o método de casting, e para ele, misturou-se a água a 90 graus Celsius com a farinha do resíduo de mandioca com a posterior adição do glicerol. E essas misturas filmogênicas foram autoclavadas. Uma parte, depois de resfriada, foi adicionada de suspensão de leveduras e outra não. Em seguida, essas soluções filmogênicas foram vertidas em placas de Petri e passou-se ao processo de secagem, que foi inicialmente realizado em estufas a 40 graus Celsius por 24 horas seguida de um armazenamento a condições ambientes por cinco dias. Percebeu-se, portanto, a partir daí, que é, os filmes formados foram heterogêneos na coloração e, além disso, foram é, formadas falhas mecânicas visíveis. 
é, acredita-se que alguns fatores foram críticos e podem ser melhorados para a produção desses filmes, como a viscosidade da solução, da solução fumogênica, a concentração de sólidos e o próprio processo de secagem utilizado. Além disso, depois de seis dias, percebeu-se um crescimento natural de fungos filamentosos formando colônias algodonosas apenas na placa de controle, em que não houve adição da suspensão de micro-organismos. Como é possível ver aqui na, na imagem, na placa A, indicado pela ICES. E isso fornece uma possível atividade do Icaramomyces anômalos nos filmes. Portanto, percebeu-se que é possível desenvolver filmes a partir do resíduo de mandioca adicionado em uma suspensão de leveduras, mas é necessário otimizar a, a composição e a metodologia de produção desses filmes. Além disso, percebeu-se também uma possível atividade antifúngica in vitro. Porém, isso deve ser avaliado posteriormente para determinar se, de fato, é, esses filmes podem, têm um potencial para aplicação como embalagens ativas antimicrobianas em alimentos. Agradecemos à Universidade Federal de Pernambuco e à Propesc pela aprovação do projeto e obrigado a todos vocês pela atenção. Parabéns por todas as apresentações. Todas as outras apresentações estão, os, dos vídeos estão no nosso site. Todos podem acessar em qualquer área. Uh, vamos passar agora para o segundo bloco do dia. E agora um link que foi mandado para vocês por e-mail e que está aqui no nosso chat. Tá bom? Até, até mais. Muito obrigada. E vamos para o segundo bloco.